Good evening. It's 5.30, so I call the uh, Advisory Board for Culture and Leisure Services Board meeting to order. Um, Secretary, will you call the roll? Mary Mascaro? Here. Angela Trulock? Here. Kathy Parks? Here. Joel Fair? Here. And Elizabeth Rock? Here. All right, thank you. On our agenda, we have uh, item one. First off, is there any public participation for our meeting this evening? These? These are for. Okay, I'll find them. All right. Yes, we do have uh, public particip participation. Uh, Councilman Willis, you're up. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to briefly say how much I appreciate your work that you're doing and your sacrifices to be doing this job. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I know how tough it can be. I know that you probably hear some things you don't appreciate at times, but I want to thank you for what you do. I want to thank you for putting yourselves out there and continue the good work. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is a great way to start the meeting. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, has any, everyone had a chance to look at the agenda? Okay. Any discrepancies with the agenda? If not, would anyone recommend that we approve the agenda as is? All right. Okay. Uh, motion made by Kathy Parks to approve the agenda as is, seconded by Betsy Ronk. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Has everyone had a chance to uh, review the minutes from our meeting in January on the 25th? Any issues with those minutes? All right, I would motion that we approve the minutes. Motion made, thank you. And seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. All right, our first uh, action item today is election of Culture and Leisure Services Board officers. Um, we have, I don't know if all of you have this, I have this. So I'll just walk us through what this election looks like. Each member has been provided two ballots, one for each officer position. Um, I will introduce them and then uh, we'll each make a mark on the box next to the person they nominate. And then Samantha will collect the ballot. So, so it's not just a nomination, that's your vote for that person, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you for clarification. So we each have um, a vote for a chairperson and a vote for a vice chair, chairperson. Does everybody have that in front of them? Perfect. Uh, so I'll introduce who we're voting for. We'll each mark them. We'll turn them into Samantha. Um, she'll organize them by the board member with the most nominations to the least nominations. And then, uh, then we'll go through the process of asking the person with the most nominations for that position uh, if they accept the nomination and then go down the line. It says if the nominee declines, the board can either revote or start the process over, or the chair can ask the member with the second most nominations. Any questions about that? Thoughts on that? Okay. Um, well, for the election of Cultural Leisure Services Board officers, we have two officers. Um, so the first one that we'll do is we'll vote for, vote once for the chairperson nomination. So if you have that in front of you, we're doing the chairperson nomination. Hopefully everyone has a writing utensil. 
So just make your vote, and then we'll turn it into Samantha. You can hand them to Molly, and she'll pass them. Thanks, Molly. We want to do this one completely all the way through and then do the second one or do the second one now? What, what would be your advice? Be? Um, it would probably be good to do the chairperson first okay, right. and because then. that way somebody doesn't end up with both jobs. Perfect. Accidentally. Yes. <laughs> Sounds excellent. All right, let's do that then. Everyone has their ballot turned in, correct? Yep. All right. Samantha, when you get a chance, will you read off the results of the ballot, um, the person with the most nominations? The person with the most nominations is Joel Fair for chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, I respectfully decline the nomination. Thank you very much. Okay. Who had the, okay, so now at this point, board, we can either go with the person who had the second amount of votes or we could re-vote. Um, I think it's up to us, so what would you recommend? Revote. Are you okay with the revote? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right, so everyone should have another ballot. Again, we're voting for the, uh, the chairperson of the board and mark your ballots and then you can hand them to, Ms. Uh, to Molly, please. Do we have all the votes turned in? Excellent. Secretary, if you would read off who has the most votes, please. The person with the most votes for chairperson is Kathy Parks. Excellent. Ms. Parks, will you accept the nominee for the chair? We swap or should we just move it? Hold on. So the next step in this is um, that some, now that she has accepted the nomination, uh, someone needs to make a motion and then second and then do a roll call. Okay. Uh, I will motion that we accept Ms. Parks as the chairperson for the Culture and Leisure Services Advisory Board. Um, motion by Joel Fair, second by Ms. Betsy Ronk. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> so this also effectively means that, Kathy, you are no longer uh, eligible for the chair. So um, to save the musical chairs, if you want to just uh, slide your gavel over. Oh, there we go. I will say that my first meeting, which is also your first meeting, and I was elected the chair on my first meeting, so that was <laughs> very surprising for me. So you've had a little bit of a, of a ramp up, so that's great. All right. Um, <laughs> the, second, the second vote that we have for tonight Oh, that's for you. Sorry. No, I... <laughs> All right, we're not now voting for the vice chair. Um, we're now voting for the vice chair. 
Uh, my name is off of that, so if you'd marked your balance, <laughs> we'll get that done. The vice chairman nominated was Mary Mosquera. Do you accept? Congratulations. <laughs> Do you accept the nomination? Yes, I accept. I would make the, make the motion for Mary Mosquera to take the position of vice chair for the board. All in favor? Aye. Done. <laughs> We're making Molly work tonight. It looks like the next thing on the agenda is to review the proposed fee schedule for non-partner league use of the courts at Nancy Hanson Recreation Complex and make a recommendation to city council. And we are looking at the paperwork that she just gave us. Any discussion? Board Chair, may I um, do a little preliminary explanation of something that needs to happen business-wise for this? I'm sorry, say that again. May I give a little introductory oh, absolutely. for this? Okay. How and um, where for? This is this is something that um, our board is somewhat unique because everybody here participates somehow in our. The, the business that our department does. So just like last year um, when we reviewed the uh, ball field or the rental fees, Joel, Joel had to recuse himself. So some of you I know most of what you do as far as engagement stuff because you've told me, um, but just in case, um, I wanted to say if you are a member or player on a non-partner athletic league that uses the Nancy Hansen Recreation Center, whether it's tennis or pickleball, the pickleball league is relatively new for our community. Um, and I'm specifically meaning those playing with, I think it's called the F Florida Pickleball League Incorporated. Um, that's the specific league that plays out of our, our courts. Uh, you are welcome to participate in the discussion portion of this item, but you are highly encouraged to recuse yourself from the vote. If you plan to recuse yourself, you must complete a form that Samantha has on hand here um, and then state at the time of voting that you are recusing yourself on the record prior to voting. This year. They've already called. Yes, they just ended their second phase of polling, which means we really don't know how many calls we get. And so the, the, the revenue is pretty much coming out. I mean, it's still pretty tight at this point in time with daily restrictions. So that's just my thought. Um, the recommendation for the revision uh, of the fee is what from staff? That's what I'm um, trying to find out. With looking at 
the, the revenue so far, and it's kind of difficult because um, you'll notice that I, I couldn't really use the fiscal year. Um, if we go back to, we typically do our fiscal years here from October through September. So if I took this data only by fiscal year, you would have some really lopsided data because the community center didn't open until May. We didn't really start charging residents until October. There was another change, I believe, um, after that. And with some of the other things, we don't have a full scope. The only thing that we have a full one-year snapshot on is the changes that have happened at Nancy Hansen. And it's kind of hard to tell uh, from just the numbers alone, um, but the income between March of 2022 and February of 2023, which is the best, most up-to-date snapshot I could give you guys with the date of our meeting, was uh, $46,499 and change. And the current year, March 23rd through uh, February of 2024, um, that's at, oh sorry, this is the C5. Um, is it $75,133 and change? So the growth of that is very, very similar to the growth of the Nancy Hansen. And in the same corresponding years, 22 to 23, it's a little over 17,000. And for 23, 24, it's a little over 32,000. So there's a lot of growth there. And I cannot 100% attribute it to the fee schedule change because we're also getting more people playing and um, especially at the C5, more people that are, are learning about the facility and, and using it. So there's a lot of variables involved, um, but I think that the current fee structure has put us on a good trajectory. Um, I've brought both facility managers here. They're welcome to come up and speak and answer questions. Um, if you'd like to know the, the feedback that they get at the front desk when, when they tell people the price, because sometimes that's, that's pretty telling. Um, but uh, my recommendation is to leave these alone, at least until we prepare for the fiscal year 24, 25 budget season. So this time next year. Um, to see if this trajectory proves correct. Because as it stands now, we're looking at considerable growth in the right direction for both attendance and um, financially. Mm-hmm. So I guess my question on that is, and I hope that it's Oh, sorry. Um, there's history here with the tennis league but um, how did it come to be that they, there's all a difference in cost per player? They were based on the average age groups of the players that were involved. The, um, one of the ta ladies' tennis teams is a 50 plus, or 55, 55, plus. 55 plus, and that actually bridges our gap a little bit because our seniors are considered seniors at 62. So some of their players fell into the senior category, I'd say a majority, but some of them did not. And then there was also the resident versus non-resident thing. That's why Gustavo set that price at the lowest, and then it just kind of went up from there. So have these prices changed over the years that the leagues have been in, in force? With the exception of the addition of the Pickleball League, these prices haven't changed since I started at at Nancy Hansen in 2014. I, I guess uh, I, w I think that it should kind of, this should definitely be looked at and um, possibly be looked to be ma made more equitable here. Um, I've had people come to me about this uh, in particular and, and some of the other issues too, um, multiple people and um, feeling that it should just be equitable across all groups. And um, if we were to do that, if we were to make it equitable for all and just make it $5 per player for all leagues, um, we would actually end up 
increasing our revenue from $4,400 to $5,500 a year. And I, I think what we have to also keep in mind is that in this next um, fiscal year, it's looking to resurface Nancy Hansen courts at the cost of $40,000, so, um, which they're needed, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, but everybody will then reap the benefit of better courts and better striping and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, or if we decide, you know, $5 is too much, then at least make it equitable. Everybody pays $4 or whatever. Um, I, I think it's really hard to, when it's not a, it's a non-partnered, it's not a league that is a city-sponsored issue. Uh, it's just more or less people renting the space for their use. Uh, it, it, then they should all be treated the same, I guess, is my theory. Not, it, it shouldn't really depend upon how old the person is. If they're renting the space, they're renting the space. Chair, may I speak to that? I have a question. Um, yes. As we think about pickleball being uh, more expensive than tennis, just from a cost per player aspect, is that due to um, length on the on the court? Is that due to um, more demand for pickleball use? And so we can, because there's a higher demand, we can make it a higher cost. Um, or Marcy, can you come up to the yeah, speaker? Marcy, that would be fantastic. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. yeah. The, the, the pickleball didn't really blossom until after I was already out of Great. that department. So she's Hi, my resident expert, literally resident. <laughs> yep, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just giving us some history to uh, both tennis and pickleball use at Nancy Hansen and why we would maybe have a discrepancy in the cost. Sure, well, like Molly stated, when I started with the Nancy Hansen, the tennis fees were already set. And I do, um, I did approach her about, as we were building both tennis and pickleball, are we gonna keep the fees the same? And here we are today. Um, Florida Pickleball, this is for the state of Florida, is a new league. And so it's, it was new to everybody. Um, and I was approached if certain teams can use Nancy Hansen as their home team. And I talked to my director and we said yes, and we came up with the $5 fee. And that's where we stand. Okay. And, and just to add a little to that in history, because I some people who are on this approached me on this, is um, it's not five dollars everywhere they go. Correct. So different if they play in Melbourne, it might be a different pricing and and Correct. such. So it's not like the league. We, sets we are it. actually the most expensive place where everybody plays for for the Florida pickleball mm -hmm. league. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of see. And, and this was, I think, the other thing that um, I don't know how often this happens, Marcy, you would know, but when either of the three tennis leagues are playing, then they use all the courts and there is no pickleball those days. So that impacts the pickleball people, whereas when the pickleball people are playing, it's only in the afternoons when there is no open pickleball and they're only playing on the three courts, so you could still play tennis, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay, I just wanted I just wanted to kind of that was very good information that you added there, so everybody's kind of aware how that how you try to schedule all that craziness. And I want to make a comment there too, just because um, you know we've been playing with the pickleball, and um, you know this is the only place that Cape Canaveral ever had to play tennis, um, and. I've, I think there should be a senior rate. We get, you know, most of us are, I'll be 71 next week. You know, most of us are up there on social security, literally. I mean, you get discounts with AARP everywhere you go on meals. And um, I just think you should keep that. And one of the reasons is, and it's very hard, um, and we can probably lose the chance to be at teams if the pickleballers are playing the same time we are, because they're they're loud, 
I mean, just no. I mean, you need all the courts. I get that. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. that's, well, that's that's that's, that's, that's not a you. that's not an yeah. option at all. But I guess if if you want to go that route, then then you should just charge everybody based on their age. And but then do you ba charge them based on being a resident or non-resident or you know if you were going to charge each league saying okay like Molly said it's really not you know senior until you're 62 well then only resident seniors are going to get this and if you're a non-resident because you're here playing somebody who is a resident then you pay the higher rate and uh, you know it's uh, I, I will also say that a lot the majority of the Florida Pickleball League players are seniors as well I I, I kind of figured that okay. too yeah <laughs> But that just makes it more difficult for the office, right? And, and it's much easier for you if everybody just pays, comes in for their league, they pay the same amount, than to try to figure out how old are you and how much should you pay? Are you a resident, are you a non-resident type thing? That, that would be more of a nightmare for the staff, right? Madam Chair, may I speak? Yes, of course. Um, working the front desk over there for I think I was at the front desk for about three years. Um, there is nothing more confusing than when the tennis, a, a new season of tennis um, with, I think we formerly had a USTA league and then the, the space sets at the time, um, when they didn't know who their opponent was because they typically, when they come in, they pay for themselves and their opponent. If they didn't know their opponent's age and residency status, they're standing there looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, and there was really no way for them to know that until they showed up because sometimes there were cancellations, sometimes there was swaps, sometimes they sent a substitute and didn't tell anybody. So I think that was part of the reason that Gustavo had set the flat rate, just to get them in, make it simple, good customer service, and get them out of the office and onto sure. the court where they wanna be. Yep, definitely. Well, that's what I'm saying. Maybe it's the easiest for staff and for everybody to just set one cost per player for league, end of story. Doesn't matter what league, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter if you're resident, non-resident. Um, it, it could be easier. It could also lose uh, the revenue that you are getting from uh, the the seniors that are playing right now that would not play. So I mean, you it's I think you're right. I think if we're just talking about ease of staff, that's the way to go. I'm not sure that that's all we're talking about. Um, my other th question for you, Miss Ronk, was you said forty thousand dollars for refinishing. Is that on the fiscal year twenty five budget? Twenty four twenty five this next coming year, yeah. Um, fiscal year twenty five starts in October. Correct. Yeah, okay. yep. We've already started getting quotes, and at this point, um, we're looking at two, two separate options, and it'll depend on uh, council's input. Um, when I get, when John and I get to the reports, I'll talk about the upcoming CIP meeting. Um, if you ever have time to kill on Google Earth, uh, look at the Nancy Hansen and play with the slide rule on the years, and I can tell you every year that the tennis court has been resurfaced and within a few months if you slide that rule over it goes from perfect to weird shadow on court five and that weird shadow on court five is a, a depression um, we took advantage of uh, an opportunity in planning for the um, stormwater components of the of the civic hub and i asked uh, the city manager if we could do a geotechnical evaluation which if you've been on the courts and you see these weird little holes that's where they bored down the uh, prevailing thought was that there was a um, an artesian well um, I don't know if you know but you are now living in what used to be the town of Artesia named for its wells uh, we didn't confirm that that was what was under there but the geotechnical survey did say you have a problem so uh, the last time these courts were redone was in 2016. The depression appeared back via satellite image within six months. Um, and now it is to the point where 
they put like a mesh coating over top before they put the asphalt and the, you know, the colored components and the lines, you can see the fibers. Yes, and you can. Yes, and you can. Getting slick. Yep. That's, and that's yeah. it, it is, um, uh, right now it's a little bit less than a quarter of an inch, um, but it, it needs to, to be repaired properly. It needs to have that section cut out. Uh, whatever is causing this depression needs to be addressed, so that'll require some excavation. And then beyond that, uh, it'll need to be put back and resurfaced. So 40,000 is the number for resurfacing. The other number will be much higher. So uh, we're kind of, you know, hoping that council will give us some guidance on which the way they want to take it, and um, we'll go from there. The, the numbers you were sharing earlier, Ms. Ronk, about uh, you did some math. If you were to level out the cost per player at $5 per person, you said that was about a $700 change in the annual revenue? No, it's a $1,100. $1,100 change, okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm thinking that $1,100 is, is good. Um, it's still just a drop in the bucket of $40,000 so, or more. Um, and if, if we were to to actually lose um, some of the revenue because we change, we raise the price for seniors that could be. Uh, well, I mean, I guess culture. it just comes down to if you want to give seniors a break, then give mm -hmm. all seniors a break. Okay. I mean, one way or the other, or split the middle and go for four dollars because adult residents pay four dollars to play now anyway. So. Um, so maybe just make it $4 for everybody. Especially since tennis hasn't raised their prices in 10 years. Um, in this day and age, I, I don't think that's unreasonable to ask another dollar or $2 or whatever in over 10 years time. One more question, that's per day, correct? That charges per day, not per game per day. Okay. Per per the per that day. Per, per cost per player yes, per, per, per day. visit for yeah. that time. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? Motion. And I'm recusing myself here. <laughs> I would motion to uh, maintain the cost as is um, per recommendation of staff and uh, for continuity. Well, I, w I would make a motion then to make it equitable. Uh, I think that we'll handle this. I can't chair. have two motions at one time, and Joel made his first. Okay. Is okay. there a second to that motion? Yes, I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose. You want to ask for oppose? We don't usually have oppose, but you can ask for oppose. <laughs> okay, I'll po she I oppose it. Okay. <laughs> so you can, can ask. <laughs> motion carries. Leave it where it is right now. So, just to confirm, all is in favor for Joel's motion. Is that correct? Yes. And I did not vote. Uh, uh, yes, you're recused. The motion carried three to one. Three to one. Three to one. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for staff reports. Uh, actually, no, we don't. Or do we have another? Yeah, we have another issue. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute.
Was there a recommendation from staff on this one? This would be another one where I would say keep it the same at least for another year, just for the consistency's sake to see if it produces, continues to produce an upward trajectory in data. I, I have one question, and this has been brought up to me multiple by multiple people in the community, and I think Marcy could probably speak to this very well, and that is the number of well, the, the, what people tell me, okay, non-resident people, pickleball players, who are not paying. And, and that is very common, that they just don't go inside and pay. And, um, and they talk about it on the court, and that's how it came to me, is people were telling me that they know of all these people who don't pay that come because they don't like the fact that it's so expensive to play here as a non-resident, especially the senior non-residents. When you go to Cocoa Beach and pay for, play for $2, and you come here and you have to pay $4. And so the question that people have brought up to me, which I, I know we've brought up once before and discussed the logistics could be, how to be would be, have to be thought through, is to somehow fence off that and make all the people go through, and like they do at this, you know, C5, where everybody's very has to pay to get in. Um, is there would there be a way to somehow do that so that you have to force people to come into the west entrance through pay and then go on to play? Interesting that you've mentioned that. Um, we've discussed that a couple times, um, mm -hmm. especially in the last like year and a half. Uh, that has been a battle. Um, also, if you have uh, time to kill, you could go around that facility and count how many signs I have made <laughs> that are still up there that say, please pay before you go in the court. Eventually, I stopped putting please. Um, that has been a challenge since the day I started. Uh, when this became a little bit more, when the courts got busier, it got even harder to control, and we have brought that up. It'll be something that I'm gonna have to work with our building official on and our fire department because we can't trap people inside the courts. And right now, um, the back sides of the gates are usually locked, um, so we will actually have to come up with a way, because um, people are smart, and people remember how you got in the movie theater when you were a teenager. So we would actually have to find a way to allow egress out without people letting friends in the back door. So it's uh, definitely something that's been discussed. If that's something that you would like staff to look into further, you can let us know that. Um, but definitely that has been a challenge for us since day one. And once upon a time, people would come in and tattle, and that was very helpful, but eventually that stopped, so. Well, and I think, uh, you know, I, I just doing some easy calculations on the number of people, I've asked around to people, like, how many people do you think on a regular basis play pickleball? But it's hard to know because people are coming and going all morning, you know. Luckily, at least now they're supposed to pay once, you know, it doesn't matter how long you stay and play and all that. But the dollars just aren't, aren't there. They're, you're not making the money for the number of people that are playing in a daily basis because um, I've had people now counting more or less throughout the morning to see how many people are really playing and people who know people coming and going. And they're saying on a daily average, there's probably at least 50 or more people who come to play pickleball. Yeah. And so that's like 250 plus people a week and you're not making that kind of money on pickleball people. Um, I'm sorry if I may speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. are, you, do. are you saying is you've been told there's at least 50 people that are on the court that have not No, no, not, uh, no, not that don't pay. I'm just okay. saying overall. You know, like from the time that you start open in the morning through, let's say, one o'clock, when most people are kind of like leaving, not playing too much in the afternoon. Um, 
some of the people play a couple hours and leave and other people come and go and blah, blah, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but people who have kind of um, counted at different times throughout the day to see how many people are there. You know, if you've got five courts or six courts going with four people, that's 24 people and you've got at least 20 people waiting right there, you've got 45 people on the court at that time. And that's a very common occurrence, especially at this time of the year. So that's why they're kind of saying, well, to say that you'd have 50 people in a day coming is not an unusual number, at least during this heavy season, I think is where these people are coming up with these numbers. And yes, the people telling me this are Cape Canaveral residents because they're not happy <laughs> because they know a lot of these people, because they play here a lot, are from Cocoa Beach. And they feel like, you know, I'm paying my money because, you know, I get a good rate, or that a lot of them say they get a monthly um, membership because it's a good deal. And it's really not that bad of a deal if you got a monthly membership as a non-resident either. But when there's no way to monitor, it's like Molly says, you know, people coming in sneaking into the theater, they realize nobody knows. There's so many people coming and going out there. I mean, even if you sat out there, you, you would never figure it out. And it's sad, I guess. It's a very sad thing when they tell me this because I just feel I trust people maybe more than you should, that people talk about it even. I mean, they're as brazen to talk about how, well, no, I'm not gonna pay you know, six bucks to come play here, or you know, a day, or I'm not gonna pay $4 a day because that's a rip off. I, you know, so-and-so only charges $2 a day or whatever. It's like, well, then go play there, you know? And some people get, you know, it's even gotten kind of testy out there, I guess. Wow. And that's the only reason I bring this up, is is the, if, we, there, if there could be, an, again, and I know we've talked about it in the past, if, if, if they could look into a better way to logistically figure that, you know, that would be. My new catchphrase is control the space. Pardon? Control the space. That's yeah. one of the challenges that yes. we face at a lot of our facilities, our events, our parks, being able to control that space without literally putting eight foot fences around everything um, is, is definitely a challenge. Yeah. But and unfortunately, you know, this becomes, it, it, it is one of the nicer places outdoors to play pickleball in the area, hence the reason it attracts so many people. Um, and it's unfortunate that you can't capture the adequate revenue, you know, to support that. that that's all I'm saying. Can I ask you know. a question? Yes. Uh, Marcy, currently what is the uh, egress off of all the courts? Like if you were to have something happen and you need to get everybody off the court, do they only go through the one gate that they come in? Yeah. Um, is there a possibility, like these breaker bars on these kind of doors, I've seen them on gates also. Mm -hmm. If we were to install some of those, then you've got one way access for emergency evacuation, right? That has a spring, closes it itself, but no one's ever gonna have any issues with uh, emergency evacuation at that point. What and about those things that I've seen it some too where they, you know, they kind of go Turn around. Turnstile? So, yeah, and, but you can't get back in. You can but always get that's out. That's not actually great for emergency evacuation. <laughs> you get four people in one of those and it's not good. Yeah, we have talked about the, the, the push button door or the, like you said, breaker bar door um, because that, that has been an issue in the past. Um, Historically, the fire department actually pulls up on the side of um, Fillmore. And one of the days, uh, probably one of my worst days at work, one of our tennis players had a heart attack on the court. And I'm watching the fire department just drive around the block and realizing that I don't have a key to the back gate because nobody had a key to the back gate at that time. That's changed now and all staff has access to it. But those were precious seconds that we could have saved. Luckily, nothing happened to Marty, and he's well and fine today. Much lower sodium intake and takes good care of himself. 
but that could have ended way worse just because um, at that time they actually had the windscreen going over the door too. Okay. So, but with the breaker bar, you could still have a key mm -hmm. that, that would open it from the other side. So, I mean, yeah. you, would, you would have the same issues that, except you would have emergency egress, which would allow you to uh, monitor and constrict entrance right. because you would have emergency egress in other places. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just mm -hmm. trying to think through some of uh, Mr. Rock's concerns and how could we address them. Yeah. Um, I'm there in the morning, normally between 7.45 and 8 o'clock. Um, we have the lady that's there is open. We pretty much know everybody that's in the morning groups that come in. There are people that do come in sometimes. It's a, at a minimum. It, it, this is not a problem. I mean, we'd like to capture everything, but it's like Molly said, there are always going to be people who try to get around. Uh, if you put some system in place, the first thing they want to do is try to figure a way around it. Uh, so it's not widespread. Uh, a lot of perception that people have, and I hear it, they, they come directly to me because I'm there on the spot. And as I talk to them and ask, start asking questions, a lot of times you find out it's not as bad as what their initial perception was. Or if you want um, to ask a particular question, you know, that you can take some action on, then they don't want to, they don't want to provide that. Mm -hmm. um, but we do a good job over there. Marcy comes in 9.30 in the morning. Uh, Dan is there first thing in the morning. I'm there. We're, I've got windows right out onto the courts. Uh, and when you do this five, six days a week, you learn. E even the uh, folks we have come down from uh, up north, we, we learn them, know their names. Um, so it's, it's in hand. It's not perfect, but it's not horrible either. I apologize, Madam Chair, for not asking to speak okay. first. I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I'm sorry. You too, John. <laughs> well, I guess, guess that gives some thought to, you know, um, what we've talked about for so many years to see what possibly could be done. Joe's got a good idea there, too, and, you know, that's something we can price out for the upcoming budget. Yeah. Can I ask you another question? Yes. I'm, I'm looking for a fee schedule for non-league um, use of Nancy Hansen. Or, or sorry, uh, you have the fee schedule review and, and revenue data for the C5 and for the pavilions and for the ball fields, but I didn't see one for Nancy Hansen, um, at least printed out. Maybe it was on the electronic one. Yeah, it is. But um, she gave us one too. She gave us a copy too. Why don't I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Got it. Yep. yep. Thank you. Oh, I had one one other question, Molly. I'm sure you can answer, or whomever. Uh, at the C5, um, in this revenue, is that um, thank you? Is that just the regular memberships, or is that also include those uh, people who get like the silver sneaker thing? Uh, or are the, they in a different category? The the day passes, or what? However, the revenue from those people who <coughs> are, have those special. Um, Let me double check the originals. Agreements, whatever you call those things. Adam. The insurance, um, the insurance beneficiaries. I think is. What I know they you call have it. a lot of those over at the C five. I just didn't know if they fell into a different category or not. Or I'm trying to see where that was. 
think it falls into a different category, but I can't remember if I added I was it to this the, or not. I was looking at the current budget that was adopted, and I was trying to figure out where those people fell. So the 75-133 number does not contain that revenue. Let me see where I, if I brought it with me. Trading case. Yeah, I didn't bring that one with me, but that does not include this because they are not subject to your fee schedule. Right, right. And, and so... You, well, I was just looking at the current budget. I think the line the, items, and I wasn't sure where they fell. That I was just curious. So they, the amount that that has brought in from all three is in addition to the seventy-five thousand one hundred and thirty-three and change. Um, the insurance benefit revenue is twenty-five thousand one hundred and forty-three dollars and change. And then, and then, it, as far as the classes, is that what falls under the contractor fees, independent contractor fees? Do they pay a fee, a percentage of their They pay 25%. They pay, they pay the facility 25% of what they pay. They pay the city 25%. Pardon? They pay the city 25% of right. their Right, I mean, income. that's what I'm saying, is they pay 25% based upon how many participants are coming to pay them. Correct? And what those participants pay. Right, they set their own... Yes, ma'am. And that's what's called the independent contractor fees are yes. for those classes. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. I, just was, I was just curious um, what that was because I was looking at the revenue, expected revenue um, in the budget that was expected this year, which obviously is, is not looking good because it was put in there that for 23, 24, they were going to make, which is, you know, goes up until October, $200,000 in revenue, and it looks like they're making about half of that. So, I didn't bring those numbers with me today. Yeah, yeah that's what I got here. So, um, I guess even if we leave it the same, I guess budgeting will have to consider that next year. That the 25%, the you mean? No, no, just in general. All of the revenue made by anything that's um, park and rec, all revenue, if you add it up. <clears throat> yes, we've already started that process. Yeah, and last year they, re they, they adopted a budget that said it was going to be $200,000 in revenue that was going to be made by park and rec in any facility, rental, Friday Fest, you know, everything all together. And uh, just looking at the uh, amount <coughs> that isn't being made at Nancy Hansen or Court Rentals or C5 or whatever, um, hopefully they'll be able to give the, the budget people better numbers this year based upon what you did actually do this year because they fell so short. That's all I'm saying. Of course. Because last year, it was, you know, they had put in that it was going to be 250000 And I know that was debatable. But um, obviously, that didn't make it either. So they downgraded that vastly for the C5. Probably good. So, and, and I mean, I know that the council and the budget, all you guys working heavily on the budget, try to do your best so that it's going to impact everybody's property taxes. Of course. And that's obviously what it all comes down to. We'll all see an increase in our property taxes, no doubt. Well, the current numbers you're using, if you're using any of these numbers, are from March of right. last year right. to March of this year, so right. that so there's fee schedules that have changed, so we can't Well, they didn't always... change except for like the ball rental fields, but the others started in January of 20. But all we can have is mm -hmm. six months of this year's budget income that we could extrapolate out 
to a year, but those numbers aren't right in front of us right the second. Um, so like the, the numbers that even we're seeing here would be a little bit off. Right, so right, right. It, uh, that's I, I see what saying you're saying, is, that we're, yeah, we're at yeah. like 100, uh, 110. And actually this number <laughs> then is actually better than it should have been. I mean, it's higher than it, they, you know, because this is partly into the next budget year from what this budget showed here that was, that's available online, so that's all I'm saying. Madam Chair, can I add to this? Can I add to the conversation? Yes. Um, the fees that you are presented with today that you're voting on do not include um, our summer rec program and the other programs that are price dependent on what it costs to actually operate the program. So you don't have the full picture of revenue there because- well, that's, that's why I pulled the budget. Right. Because that shows like athletic, you the know, income, leaks. camp registration, all of that, you know. It, that, because to get an accurate picture, you gotta look at the whole thing. So, you And know, our camp registration has increased dramatically because Byron and Shelley have added two more camps to the year that sell out as well. Great. Then that's great because you have the, you know, capacity. That's great for the kids of the city or whoever uses it. So that's good because it should be able to be fairly self-sufficient. Camp registration should be able to, you know, pay for itself in the, in, in the fees that they charge for the personnel that run it, mm -hmm. you know, so that's a great thing. So, um, I mean, I, I would say I agree, let's, we should keep the uh, fee schedule the same as it's been. I think we did a good job at coming up with, you know. Do you wanna make that motion? I, I would, I would like to make the motion that we just leave the fee schedule the same through, um, I don't know what would be a good cutoff time, you know, because in order to make a recommendation for the council or for the budget process to occur, you know, you're asking for it now in March, but we never can have the data for a full fiscal year if you really want to look at it from a fiscal perspective. So if we leave it the same, then come November 1st, we would have a full fiscal year's data right. of this of this fee schedule. Right. At which case, then I think in the winter we'd have more time to look at it and say, um, this is good, bad, and, and give a little bit more time for us to um, give them a better recommendation to see, you know, how well we're doing. Okay, so you, just to make sure I understood, um, the suggestion is to leave it like this um, for the fiscal year period of, I've been doing so much budget fiscal year stuff, I'm getting myself <laughs> confused, for fiscal year 24, 25, um, and then for say the October meeting of this year, I can bring forward our, um, our full fiscal year scope for all the, all the properties and then you make a recommendation to council in preparation for budget year 2526. Is that what I'm getting? Unless it looks like from the data that you bring forward that the numbers are really not good and we're really in it, the budget is not gonna look good, in which case then there might have to be again, like we did the one time, a change to change the fee schedule come the January 1st of 25. But that would really be, I would think, more of a recommendation from the council or something to say, you know, we're expecting more revenue than we're getting from this situation, considering the expenses for park and rec is one of the largest, you know, areas here. I think I pulled it up. It, it was $2.3 million for park and rec expenses. So, um, and we're only making $200,000 so that they might say, we need to, we need to look at, relook at that fee schedule. I don't know. That's on them. 
we take our guidance from whatever council needs, I guess. But yeah. So I would say let's just leave, like take your advice and leave it as it is until we have more data. And you did make that motion. I did make that motion. So we need yeah. A second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm recusing myself from the vote uh, for the same reason that I recused myself from okay. all you're, of these. You're technically part of the broader fee schedule, yes. So. Yes. I, I just have one question for you, Joel, because you you know the whole base the, the whole baseball thing. There's no revenue for this year since last summer. We've only had one rental. So, did, oh, but because the league pays in a different way, is that L the little league? Um, our city-based Space Coast uh -huh. Little League does not pay. Oh, they they're they're a community partner, but oh. they. In all honesty, as Joel can attest, they do pay because they do come out and assist with field maintenance and okay. they run an amazing I, I wasn't I, I wasn't sure because mm -hmm. I, I saw that there is some, it says athletic league income and I wasn't sure if that meant from little league or that's a different thing. No, that's, that is the city run leagues. Okay. For pickleball, tennis currently and okay. uh, Byron's working on basketball as we speak. Got it. I thought maybe it included um, Little League, too. Okay, we're ready to move on to the staff report. Mr. Mayberry or Ms. Molly. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we are in the final phase of completion with the Patriots Park renovation. Uh, we're down to waiting for our last load of mulch to be uh, blown in, probably tomorrow or the first of the week and have that done. We've got the um, new benches and uh, picnic table that Molly ordered. They're there, so then we've got to get those placed. She and I went out and did a walk around this morning and uh, decided where everything was going to go. So that's close to wrapping up there. And then if you haven't, if you get a chance, just to ride by there and look at the new playground equipment. It's, it's nice. It, it, just try to ignore the car wash that's going up next to it uh, and you might want to wear a mask with the dust <laughs> um, we completed the uh, Manatee Sanctuary Park the restroom uh, renovation that we were doing over there the guys just we have two faucets left to replace and Molly and I are talking about uh, putting new light fixtures in to kind of keep it in line with uh, everything else but the guys went in they stripped the old paint off the walls they got it wasn't muriatic acid but it was something like that that they put on the floor and that caused it to etch and then went back in and uh resurfaced and repainted them and did a really a bang up job uh everybody's you know if you can be happy about a bathroom they're happy uh much nicer looking so uh, the ball field baseball field where uh we should be finished with our part of replacing the old lights were the new ones either tomorrow or Monday. Um, excuse me, it won't be tomorrow because we have uh, something that they ha are dedicated to take care of tomorrow for Saturday. Uh, so yes, it'll probably be the first of the week. Uh, the only thing we've got is there's the one pole that has the transformer next to the dugout on the east side of the field. Um, our staff's not allowed to go near that, so I'm in talks with electricians now to come out and replace those fixtures on that one pole for us. Um, but the only thing we'll have left to do after the guys finish is to go out in the evening and uh, do your, I call it fields of fire uh, with the lights so we make sure we got coverage in all the right areas. Um, we have the Easter egg hunt that's coming up this Saturday. Uh, it was rescheduled from last weekend because of the weather. Um, Nancy Hansen, we are working on um, replacing lights on the uh, pickleball courts right next to my office window um, so Marcy can start running her night leagues over there. That's been an ongoing thing, but we finally got a contract that's coming to take care of that for us. Uh, Veterans Park, uh, Molly will speak to that in more detail, I'm sure, but 
We have uh, ordered the flagpole, the new flagpole today. Uh, should be here in like six to eight week lead time. Hopefully that'll coincide with the completion of the project proper. Um, we'll be ready to go at the same time. Um, and with all that, that I just, you know, once again, I always want to take the opportunity to remind everybody all that's done with two guys and an occasional hand from uh, Public Works Department. But 90% is done with just two guys in there. Uh, I like it on the record how much we appreciate them and what they do. Oh, yes. Uh, we also, outside of the field where the, the department is uh, – really promoting training and uh, Brian Strimmy is in the process. He's just begun his uh, certification process for a certified park safety inspector. So he'll actually be able to go out and look at all this equipment and do reports on it. And uh, it, it'll be a big boon for the city to have that. So that's Molly got certified twice. Uh, I got certified and now Brian is, and then we've got staff that are just, uh, there are a lot of these uh, associations that have online courses, uh, may not have a, you know, a certification with it, but it's a career building and it pertains to things that we do every day. And the guys and, and ladies have been really uh, proactive about jumping in and, and taking this stuff so we can make the department be what, it, what we all want it to be. Can I ask you if anybody's looked at the playground equipment at uh, Manatee Park? At Manatee Park? Yes, ma'am. We actually just got the uh, parts in to, um, because I know like the round swing bottoms. Yeah, there are a bunch of things that are dangerous. They, well, that's, that stuff is repaired now. Good. So uh, we had mulch blown in there, got it filled back up, and uh, it took a while because the parts that came with the, uh, equipment originally they don't use those anymore now there's a workaround <laughs> so it was a hassle getting all that stuff to get but it it's all been taken care well, of thank you I'm glad to hear that yes ma'am okay Molly um, so I will start by piggybacking off of what John ended with with the the training one of the things that um, one of my goals for uh, it's going to be a multi-year process, so we'll say fiscal year 24-25 is to get our, um, our Parks and Rec Department accredited by the National Parks and Rec Association. It's called a, a CAPRA certification. Um, my brain's fried, so I'm not even going to try that acronym, but it has Parks and Rec and accreditation in it, I promise. Um, some of the things that we're doing um, with my uh, Certified Park and Recreation Executive uh, Certificate that I attained uh, the, the, what I did, day before New Year's Eve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that last week of December. Um, him getting the CPRP, which is the next step uh, before the CPRE, the Certified Parks and Recreational Professional. Um, also, both of two of our three facility managers have completed their facility ma uh, recreation facility management program, and then adding the playground inspector to our team uh, through Brian's certification will put us on track to get accredited. And if we are successful in this, we will be the only accredited parks and recreation um, agency in the county to include the county because the county is not accredited either. But um, it's pretty, it's, uh, it actually involves multiple uh, municipal departments. A lot of this stuff um, is actually handled very much by our risk management. It's the development of emergency plans, development of safety training and protocols, um, in addition to um, using best practices for program operation, for outreach, for inclusivity, um, and of course maintenance safety standards and then having everybody um, stay up to date with their professional development and do annual CEUs. And with the uh, National Park and Recreation Association, a lot of their stuff is incredibly affordable because it's, it's better for the interest of the public for people to, to, to understand the importance of their roles in their service to the community. Um, so th the most expensive certification you can get through them is I think $450. 
um, and some of the some of the trainings and webinars are even free or fifteen to twenty dollars. So we, we take advantage of that. The city has always been a, an RPA um, participant. So I look forward to uh, getting that accreditation for the city. Um, beyond that. Um, Saturday, I hope all of you have cleared your entire calendar. Um, if you have not been out to Veterans Park, um, obviously still under construction, but you're, you're able to kind of see the beginnings of the finished product. And if you want to get on the other side of the construction tape, you can be there at 8 o'clock a.m. on Saturday, and you can help them put plants into the smart rain garden portion of the project. Um, uh, that will go on until 10 o'clock, and then you will need to um, go home and change if you need to. But the grand opening for the um, uh, Cape Center is, starts at 10.30. If any of you guys wanted to come up and speak at that, just let us know. Um, our, our program's pretty loose, pretty casual. Uh, it'll be very similar to what we did with the community center. Um, I was able to get the Peacock Cupcakes again. Um, there'll be refreshments, um, there'll be, uh, we have a couple council members that are going to get up and speak, and then we have a lot of our partners, some of our, um, contractors that were active in the project, W&J Construction and ESA Solar will be there, the Brevard Zoo, um, because they were so integral in helping us get the Bold Boards exhibit, they will be in attendance as well, so we're excited to have them, um, and yeah, this is, it almost doesn't seem real. I feel like I've been talking about this in circles since 2016, but um, uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a good time. And uh, we'll have a lot of our community partner and our community arts partners there, including uh, one of our newest instructors. Um, and that ends at 10, that'll be over at 12. Um, then you'll need to hurry over to <laughs> Canaveral City Park for the egg hunt at two. There is a brief lunch break. Um, as you know, that is like uh, the Kentucky Derby. It's the fastest 15 minutes in the city. Um, so that, that shouldn't take you too long, but Byron's made some changes to it. Um, one of the main reasons that we really wanted to um, postpone it last from last week was in the interest of not having destroyed pink Easter dresses with ball field clay, because <laughs> that doesn't come out, as Joel can probably attest. Um, next up is April 1st. That'll be Coffee with a Cop. Um, Council Member Willis it has uh, helps organize this with BCSO. If he has not come to a park near you, just wait. Um, but the next one will be out at Banana River Park on April 1st. Um, I don't have the time for that. So I'll have to circle back to you guys uh, when I have the calendar in front of me. 9 a.m.? Right, straight from the source. Um, next up after that, and this will be an important one, um, if you are able to come, this is the CIP workshop. Um, for those of you who have been around the city for a long time, we used to do an annual strategic planning. Last year's strategic planning was uh, done somewhat in conjunction with the visioning project, so it was above and beyond thorough. Uh, council decided we didn't need to re-strategize at that point, we just needed to move forward with uh, the, the mission and the vision and the values that we identified so that we can properly prioritize projects and the budget based on the, what, what we really want to accomplish for, for the community and its future. So that will be here in the council chambers at 1 p.m. And we will be, we and multiple other departments will be sharing um, the future and proposed planned um, projects and initiatives with council for their consideration and recommendation. I believe the agenda went out for that today. Um, next up, uh, recent staff activities. I, I don't know if you noticed, but um, the conversion to the .gov has begun. We can finally fit our emails on a form. We're all excited. Um, unfortunately, I still keep typing .org, but um, for the most part, all of the city emails have been up updated to capecanaveral.gov. We were very lucky because we didn't even have to include Florida because we were confirmed as the only Cape Canaveral. So 
they didn't like my Ohio suggestion of saying the Cape Canaveral, but we were trying to reduce letters. Um, the anticipated rollout for the updated website with the new Cape Canaveral um, .gov domain will be sometime this summer. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, I'm, I'm kicking myself on certain things because now I have to change every single login for everything I do, but um, I keep telling myself it's worth it at the end. Um, next up, we State of the City. Um, we are updating that. That should be complete by the upcoming CIP workshop. There's a lot of moving pieces with that one, but fingers are crossed we'll have that done. And then a quick preview for the May meeting. We will have board member interviews. Um, as you can see, uh, Mr. Holmes is not with us today. He welcomed a new grandchild and with that, new responsibilities. So uh, when he approached me and told me that he might not be able to make a good majority of the meetings, I said, go, go, go do you. Like this isn't, this isn't more important than a new grandbaby. So he submitted his resignation about a week and a half ago and um, that leaves now two vacancies on this board because uh, City Council did not vote on the recommendation for Ms. Raymond. So if um, you know of anybody that uh, is interested in getting involved, we're not the only board that has vacancies. So encourage them to reach out to the clerk's office or hop online and get an application, just same place you found them at and uh, submit their application so that we can get a, a good pool of, of people that, that are a good fit for all the respective boards. I believe um, Community Appearance has at least one vacancy and I think Board of Adjustment has one too. Um, yep, we have multiple applications already on file so um, we will probably um, do a ballot system similar to what we did tonight um, to help streamline the process for that. And then last but not least, uh, Samantha and, and Amy provided two flyers, one for facility and uh, event volunteers. Um, those are definitely needed. That's, um, we, we don't wanna create a situation where we're relying on volunteers, but we do wanna give people an opportunity to give back if they're interested, and an extra set of hands, an extra set of eyes, an extra opinion even sometimes is, is always welcome. So if you know of anybody that has availability or they're just looking to get involved, um, there is a level one background screening involved, which the city will, will cover the fees for, um, but please, get that out there, share it with your condo, share it with your neighbors. Um, we'll, we're very eager to have um, so a little more engagement. We have a couple applications now. Um, we even have a seasonal resident that will be back next year that filled out an application. She's like, I'll be back in December. You can call me then. I'm like, okay. But I'm just glad that she's interested in doing that when she's trying to take a break, you know, for her, for her holidays. Um, next up, uh, and this will be something that we will probably be bringing back to you for a formal recommendation, uh, hopefully in May. Um, as you can see, the community garden has had a slight change of scenery. And John and I, as he mentioned, uh, took a walk out there and based on the current level of construction of that car wash, the whole back whole south side of the um, garden will no longer get morning sun at the very least. Um, when they were out there doing the construction, there was concrete dust everywhere. Um, if you have a plot out there, I would recommend rinsing thoroughly. Um, they're not done with the construction. So once the construction is complete and we see the impact of that space with an active car wash in front of it, we're probably gonna need to make a decision. And that would be to either eliminate the garden, move the garden, or reimagine the garden in probably a different location. Um, so we put together a survey. It's got a couple basic questions that are geared towards um, what community gardens serve as a, a purpose in other communities, successful gardens. Um, there's a, a whole gamut of what a community garden can do, obviously, 
we are too small to grow a big crop to feed the hungry, so that's really not a, a huge option for us, but there's a lot of different engagement options that we can do that will help somewhat with food insecurities, but also for people just to have the therapeutic hands in the dirt experience as most of our condo folks don't have that opportunity unless they wanna fill their patio with pots, which also presents challenges <laughs> to getting bags of dirt and pots upstairs. So if you could uh, touch base with your neighbors, um, take the survey yourself, whether you're involved in the garden currently or not, um, part of the, the thing that we really need to do is grow this program if it is going to be successful. So getting the, the input of people that aren't necessarily already gardeners is pretty valuable as well. So um, that survey will remain open until May 15th and uh, that'll give me enough time to synthesize the results and share that with you at the upcoming meeting if you'd like to take action on it from there. And that's all I've got. Does anybody have any questions for me? Is there any other business? Actually, I actually have a couple questions, if that's all right. Um, how can we serve you and John um, in our role as advisory board? Is there anything else that you need from us besides uh, drumming up more volunteers to, to serve on the board, to putting these out. Um, is there anything that you can think of for us to advocate for you um, that you haven't already addressed? Um, CIP workshop, I mean, that's kind of a hard one for most people to swing because it's at, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday, I think. Um, engagement, yeah, <laughs> and uh, engagement in that is, is important, but also, um, yeah, the really the the volunteer thing is big, and and we don't we don't we won't ask a ton from our, our volunteers because we understand that you know people are busy and and it's difficult and it's hard to commit, and um, we just you know a couple hours a week or a couple hours a month would would help us, I mean, even something as simple as sitting in a chair and carting people at Friday Fest and putting a little wristband on. Something like that can, can help immensely because a lot of our, um, we call them celebrity beer tenders, are also from uh, volunteer nonprofit organizations and they're fishing out of a shallow pool too. So helping them out, um, even with something as simple as looking at an ID and making sure that it says at least 2023, 20, that's hard to say, <laughs> um, is, a, is, is a help to us, so. Uh, the CIB workshop is April 4th at 1 p.m. And that is in here. In past years it was done at the Radisson. Uh, another question I have would be, do we intend to maintain this schedule for voting for chair um, and, and positions because all of our terms end in October? Um, would you recommend continuing to have that um, vote happen in March or would you want this to coincide with the end of someone's term? Do you see what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to figure out how we could get back on schedule because I know we're a little bit off. That's something um, that I think this board has the ability to recommend to council. Um, the code, once I reviewed it, says it's supposed to happen in January, but that doesn't really make much sense either. Um, it would make sense to me for it to be, <coughs> you know, your, your term expo expires October 1, um, this board does traditionally meet in October at the end of the month. That would be, to me, the natural time to do it, but that would need to be a recommendation from this board, which you can take action on tonight if you like. I thought we meet November, because we meet six November? times. Oh, October we, was a special we, meeting last year, wasn't and it? And we move it up um, to the week before Thanksgiving, usually, because we do normally do uh, six meetings and we do them on the odd months, correct? That's that's correct. Okay. Yeah, last year's October meeting was a special meeting. I forgot right. about that. But so. Everybody is involved at the same, every, every, the whole board is involved. So 
not for the same year, date. but for the so same the date, same date, and so different, different times. Yeah, correct. Um, but if you'd like to make a motion that it, that take place at our November meeting to be a little bit more in line with getting new people, onboarding them. Yeah, the only other thing I was thinking is you could stick with the January meeting, and if for some reason the chair or if the chair rolled off, um, the vice chair would just convene for that meeting. Um, and so I think if we maintain January, but we just don't want to set a new precedent saying March. But if you if we said mm -hmm. January, we're going to continue to vote for our, our um, uh, board positions then that would probably be, probably which we wouldn't even need to make a motion because that's currently what it says, correct? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Perfect. Last question, sunshine laws. Mm -hmm. um, I'm bumping into an issue where I don't know if I can talk to my councilman because of the way that some of the things are, um, because I'm sitting on this board, but I'm also a resident. And so I'm just trying to find clarity on like, how do I as a resident get to talk to my councilman if, I, if we're both on boards? Right. Um, and because some of the things that I submit to council, right. then they vote on. Right. And so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna cross any, I don't wanna break any sunshine laws. Right. And I'm, I'm trying to figure that out because um, yeah, obviously this last meeting, there's a lot, of, a lot going on at city council. Right, um, and, and there's also an election coming up too. Correct. So obviously Correct. there's there's a lot of, um, it. it's, the Sunshine Law is tricky in Florida. It's as vague as it is specific. Um, the one thing that it really does focus on is whether the conversation that's happening outside of the public chambers is connected to something that either party or both parties would have to vote for. So say you're approached by your council member and they're campaigning, per se, um, you would probably not be on the good side of sunshine to immediately start discussing things that this board has to, um, has to vote on. And the directive from the clerk's office is that if um, a board member has a matter of business that they would like to take to council or go over and, sh and share their thoughts with council to do so at a public meeting as opposed to reaching out to them directly. Um, and that just keeps everybody out of hot water um, because it is, it is technically a criminal offense. And that makes it really challenging when you're in a tiny little town and everybody's voice matters and it's just easier to run into people and, and talk to them, but we still have to be on the up and up when it comes to where that happens. And any other clarification on that? Um, the Daniel or Mia in the clerk's office can, um, they, they, they can repeat that stuff in their sleep. They probably do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, could we get vacant uh, placards for any vacant seats that we have? So that if someone were watching a meeting that we have, they would very clearly see that we have two vacancies. Um, and that would be one of the ways that we could communicate that. Um, I like that. Well, so if that'll, we, that'll be ready for the next meeting. Right, because I, I think that right now it could look like we're a board of five, but if we had vacant placards, it would be very clear that we're a board of seven with two vacancies. And, and it's a, a big board and it's two different seats and they're gonna have two Yeah, I like that. I'll, I can, yeah, I'll share that at our, um, at our next meeting. Um, the, the director that has all of the rest of the boards, uh, poor guy is Dave Dickey. So um, I think that would be helpful for him because he's had as much of a challenge over the years keeping all of his boards as, as we have with this one when it comes to you know having everyone seated. But that would also help um, from a video perspective if there was just a legitimate absence and that person's name could still be up there exactly. but they could see, okay, it's still a seven member board, that person's just out today. So, very good idea. We'll, we'll have that done by the May meeting. And are we gonna rename the board? We've bounced, we threw that around a couple times. I don't think we have to, but. We don't have to. Okay, perfect. That's 
sorry. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> or do I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Dang, they got one. Motion. Meeting is adjourned.